morning, everyone. Welcome to Open Bible Church San Jose Online. We are so glad that you are joining us today for our third uh, message in our series dealing with the harvest. We are excited to be able to share with you some things that God has placed on our heart, some things that I truly believe that our church as a whole needs to be uh, putting effort into and uh, making a priority, uh, not only in our lives personally, but corporately in a, as a church as well. But before we go there, I want to encourage you to check in with us. Please uh, text to the number 408-547-4911. Again, it's 408-547-4911. And uh, if you've ever checked in with us before, text the word here, your first and last name, just so that we know who you are. And if you've never uh, connected with us before, text that word connect to that same number and let us know who you are. And we'd love to be able to uh, connect with you, to be able to make sure that you are uh, aware of everything that's going on with, with the Open Bible Church and ways in which we can help serve you. Text the word prayer if you are in need of uh, a prayer or if you have a prayer request that you'd like to join us, uh, us to join in with you to be praying for. Also, you can text the word give by texting that. You are going to be taken to the uh, church uh, giving portal on the church website, and that way you can support the church ministry, whether a one-time gift or a recurring gift, and we appreciate you doing that. Next week, on the 29th, we're going to be having a celebration of the harvest in the sense of ways in which God has blessed us, ways in which God has brought harvest into our lives. So God bless you. In just a moment, worship. we're going to be uh, taking some time to worship, and then we're going to be headed into part three of the harvest. Thank you.
I forever am in you. Maybe since my life has changed long before those rainy days, it's never really ever crossed my mind. Turn my back on you. Shelter from the storm, but instead I draw closer through these times. So I bring, I bring me joy, bring me peace, bring the chance to be free, bring me. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Hope and pray that you had an opportunity to worship with us in a way in which God has prepared your heart to receive his word this morning. And uh, we have been talking about the harvest over the last couple of weeks, 
Uh, the first message we talked about, you, you can't reap what you don't sow. In other words, the harvest happens when we reap, uh, excuse me, when we sow uh, the seeds that God wants us to, um, to sow, and the harvest that we reap is for the kingdom of God. Last week, Caleb brought a message talking about the harvest is meant to be shared. It's hard, we are meant to be generous in sharing the harvest that God has brought into our lives. And today we're going to be talking uh, about the harvest of, uh, of reaching people for Jesus. And, and the main thought or main idea is that your field is ripe for harvest. Whether you realize it or not, your field is ripe for harvest. And uh, so, <coughs> excuse me. What I'd like to do is have you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to be looking at verses 35 and 38. And Jesus is having a conversation um, with his disciples for a very particular reason. Let's read here in verses uh, 35 through 38. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. The good news is the gospel. And it goes on to say, he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to the disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who was in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his field. What I'd like to do is I'd like to break this uh, scripture down these five verses um, that I would like, or four verses, excuse me, that I'd like to kind of dissect a little bit uh, in regard to how it relates to us today. Jesus is out ministering, and everywhere that Jesus went, crowds would gather, and Jesus would be moved with compassion to meet a need or to touch someone in particular within that within that crowd, or in some cases, Jesus ministered to the whole crowd, um, the, the, um, the sharing of the fishes and the loaves and, and ways in which Jesus was able to, um, to meet the, the need of the people that were there. And so I think it's interesting that he said to his disciples in verse 37, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the field. So your field is ripe for harvest, whether you realize it or not. God has given you a harvest field or a field to harvest. And what does that look like for those who are workers? And who is a worker? A worker is not just somebody who uh, has been called to go into the field because scripture says that there were those who were called to go into the field, but when opposition came, they fled because there was no ownership or, or there was no commitment to that field. But then there were those who were willing to risk and give their life for their property, for their, for their field, for their harvest when opposition came because there was a connection to that field. And so God's not going to ask you to go somewhere where you don't have a heart for or a connection to. And really where that field is, is, is your sphere of influence, your network of people that God has as friendships, family, loved ones, co-workers, neighbors, uh, people that you you know, do sports with, Little League and all those, or music or whatever, that you build a community of connection with, with people, especially through our kids. I think about all of our kids growing up, and we had such strong connection with people through sports and through school and all the other various activities that our kids were involved in, the neighborhood kids that would come over to play, the families that we got a chance to meet and get to know, and so that's our that's our harvest field, so to speak. And so I want us to think in terms of of who is within our sphere of influence, who influences us, and who can we be an influence to. So I'd like to start with verse thirty six, where the very first uh, phrase or the very first uh, part of that sentence, in uh, in that very first part of that verse, it says um, that Jesus, when he saw the crowds. When he saw the crowds. I think it's really important for us as believers that we, that we are very aware that we see who is around us. That we see who is around us. So first of all, Jesus had to see that there was a need. And the Bible tells us that Jesus often lifted up his eyes to the crowds around him 
to see the need. And that need would lead him to have compassion on them, which we will talk about in just a minute. In John chapter 4, verse 34 and 35, Jesus has just been ministering to the woman at the well. And this was a woman, social, uh, social angst has, has basically um, uh, uh, caused her to be um, shunned by everybody in the community. She was at the well during a time where she wouldn't have to face any opposition or deal with people or anything like that. I mean, there's a whole dynamic to that story. But yet Jesus was the only one who would have a communication with her, have contact with her, have the ability to, to hear her and, and to see where she was at in, in life. And Jesus took the time to do that. Why? Because Jesus saw her. And a lot of times God places us in relationships and situations where God gives us the ability to see the people that we are with. And so the important thing about us is to understand that we need to have spiritual vision to recognize the people that God has placed in our sphere of influence. Jesus looked up and he saw the crowds. He saw the crowds. The second part of that, in, uh, of that scripture, that, that sentence, says, and he had compassion on them. So one of the questions that I, that I have is, plain and simple, do we have compassion for the lost? Jesus looked at these people, and, and he didn't reject them because of their sin. He didn't reject them because of their belief system. He didn't reject them because of their gender because of their uh, race, because of anything. He didn't reject them, but the Bible says that he had compassion on all of them. Have we as a church, have we as a people lost compassion for people, especially lost people? We are living in a culture that really has set a huge divide between believers and non-believers. People like us and people not like us. In fact, our culture is even trying to divide that segment of our culture. Even within the church, the church is heavily divided because of a belief system or belief systems that are contrary to what biblical standard would be. How do we respond? Well, Jesus saw these people, and in spite of who they were, what they believed, how they felt about him, Jesus had compassion on them. He was moved with compassion for the lost in the world. The idea is this, is that when we as believers take a look at the world and we see how lost they are, sometimes we get offended by their sin or by their lostness. And a lot of times we, we think about how their sin is so great their views are so anti what we believe in and, and everything that goes with that package. And we, we look at them and, and we think, oh, you know, God could never save somebody like that or their, their sin is so great. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul wrote, well, then should we keep on sinning? Talk about grace. He said, should we keep on sinning that God can show us uh, so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace. In other words, a lot of times we think there's not enough grace to save these who are sinning. But in the same sense, God is saying, because there's so much great sin in the world, you need to understand that my grace is greater than that sin. And we are the, we are the recipients of God's grace because of our own sin. But we're also the administrators of God's grace by being Jesus in the world to these people that really have no clue or concept of what that looks like. And I'll go into a, a minute to explain that. So let me share with you something in report that, that's important in regard to seeing and feeling the lostness <coughs> excuse me, of our generation. In a world where the secular society has set the boundaries or lack thereof for moral behavior, you can see it right now. It's easy for the Christian community to become negative and even hateful towards sinners. Come on. How many of us have, have really judged hard 
the sinfulness of our, of our world. Remember, where sin abounds, God's grace abounds even more. If we're not careful, we can become just like the Pharisees of their day that Jesus had to confront again and again in his ministry while on earth. Because of their own self sense of self-righteousness, they cared little for those who were struggling and sin, who were dying and unprepared to meet God. They set themselves up as judges rather than loving believers who were serving a loving God. That's what we have to keep in mind is that we have compassion on those that need compassion because Jesus had compassion on us. And as a result of that, we need to have compassion on the world. So first of all, we need to see, and then we need to have compassion. Have you ever heard the expression, um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care? You see, that's the dynamic of, of showing compassion to a world that needs compassion. There's a, uh, an understanding um, within missions, um, uh, especially a new missions versus an old missions mindset. The old missions mindset was we send in a missionary, they preach the gospel, they, they, um, they lay a spiritual foundation of, of this is how you get saved and this is what a follower of Jesus looks like and blah, 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 blah. And the results of that were minimal. What we have learned today is that we need to show compassion first before anybody will ever take a moment to hear the gospel. A lot of times when we will go into a mission field today, we will go in there, we'll meet a need within that community, whether it's a, a, a well for water, whether it is education for the children, whether it is medical needs, dental work, whatever needs to be done medically, a clinic for the, for the, uh, for the area, for the community. Maybe it's teaching the women how to, um, to sew and to make items that they can sell to earn money. It's bringing in farm animals and seed and things like that in which we can, we can teach the, um, the men or the, the, uh, the leaders of that community how to farm and care for animals and they can raise their own food and, and then sell the other parts like eggs for chickens or meat that's in cattle or goats or whatever. And so, so we're going in there, we're meeting a need and then as we meet that need, the people are more receptive to the gospel. And, and the reason why we do that is because we're dealing with the mindset, especially in our culture today, that it set itself up against somebody coming in and, and wanting to change your, your views, your worldview, coming in to want to change your life because, because they're good and you're not kind of an attitude. But when they begin to establish relationship, they begin to realize that you're there for a good reason, and that's to help them, and to come alongside of them, and to lead them into a saving relationship with the Father. See, the harvest field is right there. So the end of that sentence, the end of that verse in, in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, it says, because the people because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So if I were to ask you, how do you see the people around you in your life? How do we see the people around us? Well, for me, this is just me. I see people in two ways. They're either lost or they're saved. My whole objective in life is to lead the lost to be saved. And then to help the saved to, to, to be reaching back out into their community for the lost. See, it's not my job to save everyone. But it's my job to help people find Christ that they in turn can go back out into the harvest field in that same way. And again, that's the whole dynamic of our conversation this morning that we'll get into more detail with in just a minute. So how do we see the people around us? I see them as either saved or lost, and my goal is to see the lost to become saved. That's what Jesus said. I have come to seek and save those who are lost. That's what Jesus said. I have come so that those who are lost can be saved. And I don't do this as a means of judgment. I don't look at those who are lost and say, oh, I pity you. 
Even though Jesus said to the, to in Scripture they, they are confused and helpless, that's, that's a lot of what lost people are is when it comes to salvation, are confused and helpless. And it's our role and responsibility to help lead them into a saving relationship with Christ. Why? Because they're part of our harvest field. And it goes on to say, the, the word to see in the Greek, it means to know. In other words, you need to know the people that are in your sphere of influence. You need to get to know them personally and relationally. I remember a story of a woman who, uh, whose husband was not saved. And she went to one of her friends in church who her husband was a strong believer. And she said, could your husband make friends with my husband and bring him to Jesus? And so they introduced the two men. They found they had a common interest and love of tennis. So these two men would go play tennis every week. And then over the course of six months, this, man's, this woman's husband still was not a Christian. And the woman was so upset that her husband hadn't done his job to save her husband. And the woman's response, the friend's response was, um, was that her husband was building a relationship with her husband. And over the course of that relationship, uh, it, was, it came to be found out that that man came to Christ because he didn't feel like that man was pressuring him. But in due time, he saw the man, how he lived his life and, and the integrity of his character. And as a result of that, he ended up coming to Christ himself. And how was that? Because the man got to know the other man. And a lot of times, God places people in our life so that we can get to know them. Not just see them, but to know them in a way that we can come alongside of them and help nurture them and help uh, foster a relationship with Christ. See, Jesus didn't just look at people, but he saw them through the eyes of love. He didn't see what they were wearing. He didn't, he didn't judge where they were at in their station of life. But he looked inside of them, the heart, and he saw a need. And a need that was an empty void that only God could fill. He understood the condition they were in. He saw their sin. He did not judge them, but he loved them to eternity. He loved them into eternity. You see, Jesus was not speaking when he saw them helpless and in need. He wasn't speaking of an outward appearance, but he was speaking of an inward void or an inward pain. You see, sin leaves a wound, and the gospel should be a healing balm not salt or alcohol to be poured on the womb. What do I mean by that? Sometimes as Christians, we look at somebody who is not, and we see the sin in their life, and rather than be a healing balm of the gospel to, to bring them to a place of, of healing and wholeness, we would much rather throw salt on the wound or pour alcohol into that wound to create a more painful or a, uh, a more... Um, less, less healing option for that individual. Jesus did not come to condemn, but to convert, to bring us into a relationship with God. Jesus did not come to penalize, but he came to pardon us with his love, his mercy, and his grace. And then in verse 37, it goes on to say, And he said to his disciples, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. Are few. If we were to just stop and take a moment to look out into the world, we would honestly say, in agreement, we would say there's a lot of people out there who still need Jesus. Amen? There's a lot of people out there that still need Jesus, and you know some of them. You know some of them. That's your sphere of influence. That's your harvest field. See, God's not calling us to go into a harvest field that, that we would be uncomfortable with or we're not familiar with. But God is calling you into a harvest field that you know the element of the field in which you're called. And so the idea of that is that God has called us into that harvest field to reap a harvest. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. God is saying there are so many out there who need to know Jesus. See, Jesus pointed out that the harvest was ripe, and the harvest was plentiful. 
The impact of Jesus' words relates that the harvest is far too vast for a few workers who are available. So my purpose this morning is to rally the cause, is to get everybody who hears these words to realize that they are called to go into the harvest field. The harvest is great, verse 37, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. We need to recognize that we need more workers for the harvest field. Not more workers for the church. But pastor, that's what happens, right? We, we, we start volunteering for stuff now. Great. <coughs> sign me up. Sign you up. Sign us all up. But that's not the harvest field that we're called to go work in. The harvest field that we're called to go work in is the harvest field of people in your life that you don't know, that, that don't know Jesus. And that is why God has you here, is to be a worker in that field. Now, I could go into your field, but guess what? There's a lot of people in that field that won't have anything to do with me. Part of the reason is because I have a title attached to my name. I'm a pastor which is why I don't like introducing myself as a pastor to people right off the bat. Not because I'm embarrassed by that title, not because I'm ashamed of that title. I'm very, I'm very happy, I'm, I'm humbled that God has called me as a pastor and, and into ministry, absolutely. But the problem is, is there's a stigma that people won't talk to me because I'm a pastor. I walk into businesses all the time where people won't have anything to do with me. They, they walk right by me, won't even look at me. Why? Because they know I'm a pastor. And they've been hurt in the past or they have this stigma idea of what faith and religion and all that stuff, they, they don't want to deal with me. However, you could walk into that same situation and they could be your best friend in a matter of, of minutes, days, or whatever. Because you don't have the stigma of being a pastor, but yet you have the same life-changing message in your heart that I have in mine. And you have the same life-changing message to share that I have. But what makes the difference is because they know you and they don't know me. You're not a pastor, but I am. You see, God has called us all into the ministry of harvesting out of our, out of our harvest fields. Three different types of people that we're going to encounter that are in opposition to where we're at. First ones are atheists. You've met them. You might have even been one before. And who are they? They don't believe that there's a God. And then there's the agnostics. They believe that there's some kind of higher power, some kind of higher force. They may even believe that there's a God out there, but, they, but they're not really sure. They're not really sure, and especially if that God has anything to do with them or that higher power. But they have a semblance of, of an idea that there's something going on up there and out there. But they can't put their finger on it, and they can't describe it, and they can't put a name to it. And then you have this third category, and these are the apatheists. Well, who are the apatheists? These are the people that simply don't care. And I think there's more and more of these lately who just really don't care. When I talk about the gospel with, to, to people that I encounter and I start to share Jesus, a lot of times they just look at me like, I don't care. They're not going to resist me because they don't believe in God. They're not going to resist me because they're not sure if there is a God. But they resist me because they don't care. They don't care whether there's a God or not. And so this feeling of apathy is very, very prevalent in the people that we are trying to reach. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22 um, it says that Jesus was walking along the shore of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon and Peter. Uh, Simon also called Peter and Andrew, throwing the net into the water, and they fished for a living. He called to them, come and follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And then they left their nets at once and followed him. And a little further up, verse 21, up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called out to them, too, and they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. And so Jesus called them to reach people. And so Jesus is calling us 
to learn how to be fishers of men. And I know that's a little different than being a worker in the field, but, but understand that the focus of this is the calling. Jesus has called us all to reach people. What did he say? He did teach them how to be fisher of people. I love that. I will show you how to fish for people. Well, one of the things that Jesus is trying to do is to get us to recognize that there is a field. That field is great. There needs to be more workers. And the fact that you have now been saved makes you part of the workforce. So the thing is this, is that your story of your life, how you came to Christ, matters. Your story matters. And the fact that, um, that you have been called because your field is ripe for harvest because you have relationship with your field and God has called you to be a worker in that field. So Jesus takes a redeemed man with a redeemed story into an unredeemed world, or back into an unredeemed world. So Jesus saves us out of the world and places us into a personal relationship with him in order that we may go back into that world with a redeemed story, a life, of transform, a, a life story of transformation, a story that says, Jesus has made a difference in my life. And that's the message that we take to the harvest field. And there's not enough people taking that message of hope. Not a message of condemnation, not a message of judgment, but a message of hope. So Paul says this. He says that God sends us into the fields. This is, this is a variation of Paul's writings. He said he takes us out into the fields and he reminds us, Scripture reminds us that the great commission that we see in Matthew that Paul um, personifies in his life mission that it is a command and not a suggestion. In other words, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go into all the world and take your story of a life that's been changed because of the gospel. That's the message that we take into our harvest field. So in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it kind of defines what we do in this, in this world. Well, what, how do we take the message or, or what's the... Uh, mode of operandi that we, that we use in bringing the message to the, the harvest field. Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. So we are co-laborers or co-workers in God's service so you are God's field, God's building. So basically, God has called us into the harvest field to, to water and to, and to plant. And so are you a planter? Are you a waterer? I also have a question. Are you a pollinator? So what do I mean by that? Pastor, where are you going with this? Well, I've, I've told the story before of my most recent garden. Didn't do as well, and the reason being... Is, I mean, it did okay. I, I, I reaped a harvest out of it, but not as much as I thought I would for the amount of plants that I planted. What ended up happening is that you basically take what, um, what you had been happening in your life and you begin to pollinate other people. So there's a statistic that says a person won't come to Christ unless he's heard the gospel over seven times. So when a person hears the gospel that many times, that, that's the seed that's being planted. And in order for that to take, in order for that to begin growing, it needs to be nurtured and it needs to be watered and I believe it needs to be pollinated. And so we become pollinators of the gospel when we begin to share with others. I've, I've, I've had conversations with other people who, um, who have come to Christ, not because of what I shared with them, because... My, my conversation with them is after the fact of their salvation, but they talk about the people that fed into their life, that brought them into a personal relationship with Jesus. And some of those were planters, some of those were waterers, and some of those were pollinators, people that just constantly fueled the, the, the seed and, and, and the nurturing uh, of that seed into a place where they finally were able to grow into a relationship 
with Christ. I think it's really important for us to realize that there are so many different ways that we can influence and impact our harvest field. And then it goes into verse 38. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. And it says this, ask him to send more workers into his field. So Jesus is saying we need to be praying for more workers. So my question is, are you willing to be one that says, we need more workers, God send me. We need more workers, God send me. So this goes back to Isaiah, where in verse, uh, chapter 6, um, in verse 8 or so, uh, God asks a question after Isaiah has this intense encounter with, with the presence of God in the temple. And God says this, he says, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? In other words, who's going to be my prophet, my, my voice for, for the gospel, basically is what God was saying. Who's going to go? Who's going to go for us? And then Isaiah said this. His response is, send me. Send me. So I think the question is, are you going to go? You see, pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. So the Lord's in charge of the harvest. He saves out of the harvest, which we were once a part of that harvest. And he saves us to do what? Sit on the sidelines and watch all the work, or watch all the action? No. He saves us to now become workers in the harvest so that more people can be saved out of the harvest to join us in being workers. See how that works? You see, the Holy Spirit draws us to salvation. The Holy Spirit then gives us words to say once we're part of the work crew, once we're part of the workforce, and then God sanctifies us. So he saves, he sends, and then he begins to clean us up. Some people say, I'm not good enough to be a worker. How can God use me? Because you have a story to tell. You have a testimony. And God wants to take that testimony, God wants to take that story and show people how he has cleaned you up to be the person that you are and where you're at in your life may not be where you want to be but maybe God can use you where you're at to save somebody else to have somebody else go from a harvest to a worker from a harvest to a worker so whom shall I send as a messenger to this people who will go for us Lord, send me. Will you pray that prayer this morning, Lord, send me? You see, there's a world out there that needs to know that Jesus is real. They need to know that Jesus makes people different. They need to know Jesus in a personal way. You see, the harvest, Scripture says, is plenteous, but the workers are few. Would you pray to the Lord of the harvest for workers to be sent. And then don't be surprised when he answers your prayer by putting you into the ripe and ready harvest. I believe there are some believers this morning who are here who want to try and witness, or that you want to try and witness to, and occasionally you, you do, but you find it difficult. Remember this, you're not called to be successful, but to be faithful. One thing I have learned is, is I've made many a mistake sharing the gospel with other people, more than what I'd care to admit. But out of those mistakes, I've learned how to do it better. So rather than not do it and be fearful for what I might say or might not say, I put myself out there to do it in order that I might learn how to do it better. And I challenge you to do that. Would you be willing to step up this morning? Would you be willing to say, Lord, use me? Would you be willing to go to the field of the harvest and work? God is calling workers. Can you hear him calling? Are you listening to that call? <coughs> it is my prayer that you will hear him, that you will respond to that call, and that you will look out into the harvest field that God has placed you and realize that there are those that God has put you in contact with 
that he wants you to be the witness to. I truly believe that your field is ripe for the harvest. As we close this morning, I want to challenge you to let me know, Pastor, this is the area I struggle with in the harvest. Could you text me to that number, 408-547-4911. Write that down, please. 408 547 4911. Would you text me where you might be struggling, where you might need someone to come alongside of you to help you be a witness to the harvest? Maybe to pray with you for those that you are witnessing to. Maybe to be a, um, a, a sounding board as you're trying to figure this out to hear you share what you want to share, maybe to bring wisdom or direction on how we can do better. We all can do better. So I challenge you this morning, would you be willing to step up and be part of the harvest field? Would you be part of the workers to reach into the harvest field? If you would do so, would you please let me know? Say, Pastor, I want to be a worker. Text that to me. Pastor, I want to be a worker. And I would love to follow up with you in regard to that. God bless you. Have a great week. Hopefully see you next week at church in person as we celebrate a harvest. We love you. We appreciate you. Uh, whatever you can do to help support by giving, whatever you can do to help support by praying, send us your prayer requests. Send us anything that you feel might be helpful uh, to help you in your walk with the Lord. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless. Have a great week. See you next time.
hands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my comfort. 